Uh, greetings. Uh, this is Celebration. My name is John Savers. I'm your host. And today we'll continue with our recent series, uh, Jews and Their Culture. Now, for those of you new to Celebration, uh, this is a program which takes a look at peoples and their cultures and tries to get a better understanding of what makes them tick. Now, uh, we do understand that most people have a general uh, idea of uh, most peoples and their cultures uh, due to uh, television uh, programs touching upon such, uh, magazines, print, uh, newspapers, and so forth, movies, of course, uh, which uh, may uh, have in part a, a certain locale uh, of a given people or, or uh, touching upon a culture. So we do understand that uh, there is some notion already. Uh, and uh, this notion uh, may be uh, pretty largely correct or it may be somewhat uh, misshapen uh, due to the um, particular uh, medium that uh, exposed the viewer to that uh, cultural peoples. At any rate, uh, we are trying to bring forth uh, uh, another look. Uh, sources perhaps you are not familiar with. Uh, we do uh, use reference books, of course, uh, little known books, out of print books, uh, uh, magazines, bulletins, uh, and so forth, uh, and try to bring forth uh, cre credible information which does provide a clear understanding. Uh, and in that sense, uh, Celebration is an educational program. Now, uh, because we are trying to fill in the gaps, as it were, uh, it may appear to the um, not really perceptive person uh, that this particular program uh, has a kind of a bias uh, in favor of um, uh, a, a slant which might be considered negative. Uh, this is not true at all. We are, however, trying to fill in the gaps and most of the gaps that occur are in the way of uh, obscuring or uh, obliterating uh, these negative aspects. To have a well-rounded uh, view, you need both the positive and the negative. Uh, and uh, hopefully, um, when everything is put into play, uh, they sort of uh, uh, neutralize one another and you have uh, a generally uh, positive or, or neutral uh, view uh, toward this particular peoples or cultures. Anyway, you do have a better understanding. So on that note, uh, we will proceed. Now we've talked about uh, jewelry and according to the flesh. Uh, and uh, I will say in passing, as a sort of um, uh, addition, um, a footnote, if you will, uh, on that particular aspect, um, uh, there, there seems to be a tendency sometimes to uh, place jewelry as being issuing uh, from a single source. Uh, and I think this is uh, entirely wrong. What makes uh, a modern Jew a Jew is not the flesh from which he comes or she comes, but uh, adherence to the Talmud uh, slash Kabbalah. Uh, and um, uh, uh, this is the formative uh, material. Uh, and uh, touching upon jewelry according to the flesh, we did note that uh, in regard to uh, the forming or misforming of the house of Judah, um, after the captivity, uh, there were two really noteworthy events. But uh, even prior to that, there was a noteworthy event, and that happens to be the whereabouts of the Canaanite people uh, in Canaan, who was cursed by Noah, uh, did produce a number of children, I think something in the order of 10 or 12, uh, quite a lot, some of whom appeared to, to have disappeared, uh, and uh, where they went to, no one seems to be particularly interested. 
Now, I don't know either. I have hypothesized that some had gone um, possibly as traitors, uh, basically, uh, to um, uh, the area of the Balkans and so forth. But I thought that the great bulk of the Canaanites drifted toward their kinfolks in Edom and in Egypt, and possibly even further into Libya and south of Egypt. Um, we, we find that uh, Esau had taken Canaanite wives, uh, and although Edom refers to Esau by name, uh, the Edomites are the seed of Esau, uh, it's not just a one-way seed line here because uh, Esau did marry Canaanite women who contributed their own, shall we say, uh, DNA line, uh, um, their own seed line, as it were. So uh, these came together, uh, and I think that what became known as Edom was uh, primarily a Canaanite population. Uh, we have also in the earlier program discussed the Jews of Elath as most probably uh, descending from Judah, the son of Jacob Israel, who married Surah, Surah the Canaanite woman, uh, and producing uh, some non-Israelite uh, or half-Israelites uh, outside the congregation, amongst which uh, we find Sheila. Uh, and this particular line of uh, Judah, Sheila, I think, as we have indicated in that uh, program, uh, became what is now called the Jews of Elath, making this population adjacent to Edom, uh, also uh, part Canaanite. And I think that that relationship uh, made it easy for the Jews of Elath to merge with the uh, uh, Edomite, Canaanite population of Edom. And because of the association with Judah as a uh, patriarch, I, I think that the southern branch, branch of the house of Judah, the population there, probably find accommodation with and uh, merging to a certain extent with the Jews of Elath and the Edomite, uh, Canaanite population there, uh, and uh, we see that as probably happening. Um, now, uh, we just add that, uh, and then we, we have the Assyrians taking away 200,000 of uh, the house of Judah from the outlying areas, I think probably mostly of the northern areas, off to Assyria with the um, uh, the house of Israel. The Judahites remaining mostly being within the walled uh, city of Jerusalem uh, and there also a mixed multitude, a multitude to boot. Uh, we think that when the heat was off in that particular event um, uh, there was probably a, a move upward from Edom and from the uh, Jews of Elath and whatnot for that population down there uh, northerly uh, and uh, filling up the gap, so to speak. When the Babylonians came along and took off uh, uh, the Jews of um, uh, Jerusalem, the, the Judahites there, plus the mixed multitude, plus whatever they found in the vicinity, and took them to Babylon, uh, then we have another population. We have a population which is legitimately of the um, a house of Judah, and I think some mixed multitude to boot. Uh, and after the business of Haman uh, had been concluded, uh, the Bible relates how many Chaldeans, to save their skins, converted uh, to um, a Jewry. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have another uh, change in the population, uh, a change that probably was not as drastic uh, as the changes that were taking place in and about the old uh, uh, you know, land of uh, Canaan and uh, uh, Palestine, generally speaking, as we, we think of it. So uh, we do uh, state this, and of course it's well known that um, uh, the, uh, the population of Kasaria, that uh, empire, was uh, uh, converted to Judaism. Why did this happen? 
Well, I believe that the, uh, the Udites and the, uh, uh, the mixed multitude amongst them uh, who had become adherents to the Talmud, which became uh, a dominant mode of religious thinking at that time uh, in, um, amongst the Babylonian Udites, um, I think that they perceived the Kassarians uh, incorrectly as the, um, the house of uh, the remnant of the house of Israelites of Israel rather, uh, and that that is why uh, they probably went up uh, and and made this uh, conversion, thinking that they were reuniting uh, Israel. Uh, and when they discovered the error, uh, they had no choice but to kind of cover it up as, as best as possible. Uh, and in point of fact, uh, these people who admitted to being Japhetic um, uh, kind of became uh, uh, more Israel than thou, or more Jewish than thou, uh, and um, uh, became a, a backbone of the movement um, and uh, introduced a large population. But the king of uh, Caesarea had brought in from uh, the Babylonian area uh, rabbis uh, and teachers, uh, scribes, and so forth to um, I instruct his population, his, uh, the people of that empire, uh, in the ways of uh, Jewry to build synagogues and, uh, and so forth, uh, uh, institutes of learning, yeshivas and so forth. Uh, and uh, undoubtedly these uh, rabbis brought uh, an entourage. And although it may have been relatively small, uh, this did in, indeed nevertheless uh, introduce a um, legitimate uh, connection, um, however thin, uh, to the, uh, the old house of Judah, Israelites in other words. So there you have it. Uh, uh, this is uh, how we see this uh, particular population at this time um, uh, being uh, on, on the one hand, one extreme, uh, essentially Kassarian or non-Jew, non-Israelitish, uh, and on the other, uh, Edomite, uh, Canaanite, which uh, at least in part is Hebraic, but uh, is not uh, of the um, uh, Jacob-Israel line. Uh, and then uh, in the middle, the, uh, the Judahites who went to Babylon, and uh, uh, how much uh, integrity remained uh, in regard to uh, their uh, genealogy is uh, anyone's guess. But we do know that uh, even to this point in time in the state of Israel sick, um, in places such as Tel Aviv, uh, counterfeiting of uh, papers, documents of government and so forth is big business. So therefore, um, faith in any kind of genealogical text produced um, would have to be um, something of a blind faith. But at any rate, uh, we did touch upon uh, Jewry in a physical sense, uh, which I've just done. Uh, and then we turn to um, uh, Jewry according to uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, we have touched mainly upon what we think most essential uh, are those uh, dealing with the Talmud and the Kabbalah. Uh, and uh, although uh, there are uh, Jewish congregations which may be only loosely um, associated with, um, shall we say, the orthodox uh, uh, Talmudic uh, points of view, um, it is still uh, quite strong and um, uh, essential to understand uh, if you're going to understand the thinking in this particular group. Um, so we've done that and we looked particularly at the Kabbalah uh, and um, uh, some of you are probably a little tired of hearing about the Kabbalah and the kind of thinking to be found in there. So, um, I, in a recent program, I have dealt with the idea of the Messiah uh, in uh, Jewelry. Uh, and we also, I uh, think, will take a look today at another idea which is uh, pretty prominent, um, particularly today, uh, in the talking and thinking of Jewelry. Uh, which uh, deals with, shall we say, um, dignity or human dignity, um, uh, Jewish prejudices, um, the, um, uh, the question of prejudice, um, uh, and what the Jewish uh, point of view is on, on these things. So um, I guess you would say uh, human dignity, human discrimination uh, might be um, 
the uh, overall tag we'll put on uh, our look today. So let's go forward now. Now there is no controversy in Judaism regarding the concept of human dignity. It is recognized as an important concept with questions involving only how important dignity is in the hierarchy of Jewish values and why it is so important. Which Jewish values are less important than human dignity and which are more important? The sources themselves reveal an attitude marked with great Jewish sensitivity to the individual person. Now this is a citation from Nachum Amsel, the Jewish Encyclopedia of Moral and Ethical Issues, page 112. Well, in talking about uh, Jewish views on uh, subjects, uh, it is of great, great importance to be sure that terminology is defined. Uh, and even so, uh, a word that you think uh, is universally understood uh, may have a singular uh, definition uh, from the point of view of Jews or from the point of view of those who fully understand the point of view of Jews. But uh, bearing that in mind, let's go forward. There is a general feeling, even among secular people, that it is somehow improper to insult another human being, hurt his feelings, or cause any psychological discomfort. Judaism similarly believes that it is one of the 613 mitzvot to treat every person as you would treat yourself, to speak only positively about another person, and to even care about the monetary assets of another person as much as a person would about his own. This is based on the Mishnah, which tells a person to treat another with the same dignity as he treats himself. But when it comes to the reasons behind these generally held attitudes, secular society and Judaism part company. The Midrash says that each time you embarrass another human being, you also diminish God himself, the creator of that human being, who is created in God's image. Based on this concept, we can understand a series of Jewish laws that are different from secular society regarding the embarrassment of another person. This is a citation, again, from Nachum Amsel, the Jewish Encyclopedia of Moral and Ethical Issues, 112. Now, in reading this particular uh, citation, and for you listening to it, I, I think that it will seem to many to sort of dovetail with an impression that they have of Jews today as being a thoughtful, liberal uh, sort of people um, and uh, trying to um, bring forth a state of, uh, of uh, equality and dignity uh, uh, and so forth for all. So uh, it would be um, uh, interesting uh, to, uh, to understand what is behind uh, this um, this, this concept of dignity. Um, let, let's look at this a little further. The Talmud says that preserving dignity is so important that one may violate a negative mitzvah for the sake of preserving dignity. Later authorities rule that a person may violate any rabbinic, not biblical, injunction in order to preserve dignity. Since most of Jewish practice is rabbinic, not biblical in nature, most practices in Judaism cannot be violated if doing the mitzvah would necessitate violating a person's dignity. When a Jew has to choose between fulfilling the mitzvah of reading the Megillah on Purim and burying the dead where no one else is available to bury, which takes precedence? the dignity of the human body, even after death, or publicizing the miracle of Purim. The Talmud clearly states that human dignity takes precedence. 
The Talmud goes on to say that this mitzvah, burying the dead and not letting the body remain shamed and unburied, is so important that even a high priest who may not willfully become impure by going to the grave of even his closest relatives must become impure and bury the stranger if he is the only person around. The Torah itself shows its sensitivity to the concept of not embarrassing anyone. The verse says that the place to which the burnt offering is brought should be the same place the sin offering for accidental sins is brought. The Talmud explains that the Torah was trying to protect the identity of those who brought a sin offering so that no one could tell by looking at a particular place in the temple if the people were sinners or not. Now this is a citation from Nakam Amsel, the Jewish Encyclopedia of Moral and Ethical Issues, page 113. Now, it, it may be that this sensitivity within um, rabbinic Jewry for the um, dignity of uh, all people uh, manifests itself in what might be called uniformity or equalitarianism. Uh, and this in itself uh, is not necessarily wrong, but uh, of course could be reduced to absurdity. But let's just give you an idea of where it is not reduced to absurdity uh, and uh, can see how it might uh, be helpful uh, in preserving dignity. So I'll give you a citation on this. In another effort to protect the identity of the poor and not embarrass them, it was a custom on the 15th of the month of Af for all the eligible girls to dress up and for the eligible bachelors to meet them. Since it would be embarrassing if the poor put on their best clothes next to the rich who put on their best clothes, the edict was issued that all the girls would exchange their best dresses with each other so that no man would know who was poor and who was rich, avoiding any unnecessary embarrassment. On a daily level, the manner in which a person properly fulfills the mitzvah of Zadokah, Jewish charity, depends on a maintaining the dignity of the poor person. The entire eight-step hierarchy of giving Zadokah, according to Maimonides, depends on embarrassing the poor person as little as possible. That is why the highest level of zedekah is giving the poor a job or a loan. This is a citation from Nakam Amsel, the Jewish Encyclopedia of Moral and Ethical Issues, page 114. Well, we see that uh, some thought indeed has been um, uh, expended by uh, learned rabbis uh, in regard to this particular matter. Uh, certainly uh, for a society which lived uh, rather close together in communities, often in ghettos uh, in later years, um, uh, this, this sense of dignity must have been quite important. Uh, but what happens when a Jew uh, violates this uh, idea of dignity? Let's look at that. The Jewish view for those who do not retain the dignity of another person is extremely severe. When the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva, all great Torah scholars in their own right as students of Rabbi Akiva, did not respect one another properly, they all died in a plague because of this sin. The Talmud proves from the story of Tamar that it is better to die in a furnace than to embarrass someone. Tamar was willing to die rather than reveal publicly 
that her father-in-law, Yuda, had sexual relations with her. Of course, at the time, Tamar was able to convey to Yuda who she was through a code, and he was thus not embarrassed. Here's a citation from Nakam Amsel, the Jewish Encyclopedia of Moral and Ethical Issues, page 115.